Namaste. Welcome to the next episode of Yoga Vasishta. Today we're going to cover the amazing Chapter 3. I, I say it's amazing because it contains the instruction of the entire book in a nutshell. And we'll also see how it is in harmony with all the great teachings such as Buddha's teaching and so on. So let's get right into it. Bharadvaj said, O Brahman, first tell me about Rama, then enlighten me by degrees with the knowledge of how to attain liberation in this life so that I may be happy forever. Valmiki replied, Know, holy saint, that the things seen in this world are deceiving, even as the blueness of the sky is an optical illusion. Therefore, it is better to efface them in oblivion rather than to keep their memory. All visible objects have no actual existence. We have no idea of them except through sensation. Inquire into these apprehensions, and you will never find them as real. It is possible to attain this knowledge. It is fully expounded here. If you will listen attentively, you shall get at the truth, and not otherwise. So this is a fabulous statement. Huh? This is Valmiki himself. And he's telling Bharadvaj that the answer to his question, how to remain happy forever, huh? which I think is everybody's question, isn't it? I mean, what is the use of life if we're not happy? If we're suffering, if we're in anxiety, uh, if we are uh, overcome with lust and greed or fear, then what's the use of living? Why even go on with the charade, right? Might as well just end it now. And a lot of skeptics have come to this same conclusion. But no, there is a solution. And the solution is given here. And what is it? The things seen in this world are deception. Just like if you're traveling in the desert and off in the distance you see what appears to be water. Well, of course, there's no lakes in the desert. <laughs> That's why it's a desert, right? So it's an optical illusion. Just like the blue color of the sky. The sky really isn't blue. It has no color at all. So why does it appear blue to us? It's an optical illusion, the scattering of the light by dust and other molecules up in the sky. So this is well known to those who are acquainted with spiritual knowledge, that everything we perceive or apprehend in this world. By the way, there are three definitions to apprehend. One is to arrest somebody <laughs> or get something. And the third one is to perceive. Apprehend means before touching it. Huh? Before touching it, we see it, right? But what if we see something, but we can't really touch it? Is it actually real? Is it actually tangible? So, so many things in this life that we see are simply our own projection. Uh, for example, a corporation, a government, a religion. All these things are simply abstractions. They exist only in words. Actually, what it is, is there are people running around doing this and that, and they're kind of somewhat in agreement on something. And so their actions are more or less in harmony, at least for now. <laughs> but we say, no, that's a company. That's a government. That's a religion. Or that's a political party or this or that. But these are simply fabrications. They're not real. And so similarly, 
other things that we take as real are just fabrications. Huh? And we'll get into this in great depth, believe me, <laughs> as we go through this teaching. And uh, by the end, you will be convinced. And that's why he says, simply by hearing, if you hear nicely, everything is expounded, everything is given. Huh? Just hear it well, and it will have its effect. The conception of this world is a mistake. Though we actually see it, it never exists. It appears in the same light, O sinless saint, as the different colors in the sky. The conviction that the objects we see do not exist of themselves leads to the removal of their impressions from the mind. Thus perfected, the supreme and eternal bliss of self-extinction springs in the mind. Otherwise, there is no peace to be had for men like you, rolling in the depths of studies for thousands of years and unacquainted with true knowledge. It's a subtle put down. <laughs> Bharadwaj was a great scholar. He knew all the Vedas and Puranas and Itihasas and so on. But he still hadn't reached the realization. And that's why he was approaching Valmiki. Because Valmiki was known to be fully self-realized. After all, he had been a hunter and a dacoit, a really nasty guy <laughs> in a previous life. But then, because of meeting Narada and being given the name of Rama as a mantra, he became fully self-realized. And that's how he could write the pastimes of Lord Rama even before Rama's appearance on this earth. He had that deep of a vision. So in this way, Valmiki was known as deeply, fully self-realized. Even Bharadwaj, with his tremendous knowledge, didn't have the same. So now, what is he telling Bharadwaj? Get rid of all these ideas, man. <laughs> Drop the mind. And you will achieve self-extinction, nirvana. This is actually identical to the Buddha's teaching. I think, historically speaking, when Buddhist, uh, Buddhists were kicked out of India violently and with great loss of life and bloodshed, that the more intelligent people wanted to preserve the Buddha's teaching in a form that would be palatable. So they wrote things like this Yoga Vasishta, and other similar works, and culminating in the teachings of Adi Shankara, that took the insights of the Buddha, which were so penetrating and effective at delivering real enlightenment, and they put them in the context of Vedic culture so that they would be preserved. And so we have uh, a great deal of appreciation for whoever wrote <laughs> Yoga Vasishta, maybe Vasishta himself coming back again to remind us of the real truth. Complete abandonment of desires, vasana, mental conditioning, is called the best state of liberation, moksha, and is the only pure step towards happiness. The absence of desires leads to the extinction of mental actions in the same manner as the absence of cold melts small particles of ice. Our desires uphold our living bodies and bind us tightly to our bodily prison like ropes. These being loosened, the inner soul is liberated. So Ramana Maharshi especially has given extensive teachings about vasanas. Vasana, or desire, is based on memory. We see something, either in the world or in our imaginations, or maybe in a dream, and then we think, I want that. Whether it's an object, or a state of being, or a particular mental impression, 
then it leads to mental action that, okay, how can I get that? What do I have to do? Huh? How do I have to manipulate things and people and do stuff to get what I want? And of course, this leads to all kinds of terrible, bad behaviors. So people are in conflict in this world, fighting over objects that are themselves temporary, like power and position and designation as being number one in a certain field or something like that. Uh, people are in competition with one another, even with members of their own family. I experienced it in my family. Everybody was fighting over my grandmother's inheritance. It was horrible. So because of desire, all kinds of sinful, destructive, nasty activities take place in human society. And within us, what does it do? It creates this false ego, the false sense of I am an individual separate from everybody else and from God. I was contemplating this last night and I was thinking, you know, really, this ego is like a disease. And right now, the human society is suffering from a plague of egotism. And because of this, there's a natural response from nature, huh? like an antibody. And that is the spread of this teaching of enlightenment. So if one takes this teaching to heart and implements it in one's life and restructures the mind according to it, then this disease of egotism can be cured. And what is the result? Happiness, ease, huh? no more struggle, no more competition, no more mental actions of how can I do this? How can I get that? How can I beat this other guy? All of that stops. And what you wind up with is peace, real peace, the peace that passeth understanding. In other words, the real peace is beyond the mind. So when the mind is made inactive through meditation, then we start to get to the real good stuff in life. Vasana is of two kinds, pure and impure. The impure ones cause reincarnation, while the pure ones serve to destroy it. And impure desire is like a mist of ignorance the stubborn, obsessive feeling that one is the individual ego. The wise say that individual ego is the cause of rebirth. A pure desire is like a parched seed that is incapable of bringing forth the germ of rebirth. It only supports the present body. Pure desires, unattended with rebirth, reside in the bodies of men who are living liberated Jivan Mukta. They are like unmoving wheels. Those who have pure desires are not liable for rebirth. They are said to be knowing all things that ought to be known. These are called Jivan Mukta and are of superior intelligence. So some people say, well, you have a desire to teach. That's why you're doing all these videos. And you must also have a desire to attain enlightenment. That's why you're doing meditation and all this stuff. So what's this about getting rid of desire? No, we, we need desire to maintain the body. I remember <laughs> after attaining fourth path, which is the destruction of desire, destruction of lust, I was in a quandary. I was thinking, to how can I support and maintain this body without desire, without any desire at all. It's impossible to go on living. How do you even plan like what to eat today? <laughs> so in the past, one could become a monk or hermit and go begging and people would supply your needs. But now, of course, people have become much more selfish and egotistical. So it's not so easy to live by begging. 
And if one does, it's a real hardship. But there is a class of desires that are untainted by selfishness. And of course, the desire to share this knowledge is the topmost because it benefits other people. Now, of course, I know there are many phony teachers out there. Uh, in fact, they outnumber the real teachers, <laughs> five to one or 10 to one, maybe more. But if you have reached the end of this process of self-realization, what else is there to do? Huh? Of course, I can still my mind. I can sit under a tree. I can be perfectly happy doing nothing, <laughs> staring at the wall. <laughs> but while this body exists, it may as well be used to benefit others. Uh, because the prarabdha karma that created this body is not yet used up. So you might as well keep it going. Uh, because what you think of at the time of death is what creates the state of being in the next life. There's a famous verse in Bhagavad Gita that whatever you think of at the time of death. So what do you think of at the time of death? Well, it's also common knowledge that one's whole life passes before one's eyes at the time of death. So whatever you have been thinking your whole life becomes what you think of at the time of death. It's more or less automatic, like a tape being rewound. Huh? So if you have been thinking high thoughts, unselfish thoughts, pure desires, huh? desires to love God, desires to know the truth, desires to help other people, that's what you will think of at the time of death. And that will give you a very high destination in the next life. And if you have actually attained the highest realizations, then at that moment you get moksha and you become ineligible for rebirth. That is the greatest happiness because then you simply uh, become one with the source, Brahman and you go everywhere, and you become everything. And we'll read about this in later chapters. But for now, just know that this beautiful summary of the whole teaching of Yoga Vasishta is going to give us the very same realizations that were taught by the Buddha and led to thousands and thousands of people attaining release. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Harihi Aung. Karunar Navamai Kardakadinal Gum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam.